Traveling through South Holland, one may think it looks like any other suburb in the Chicago land region. It has homes, schools, businesses, and an interstate passes through it. But South Holland has a rich history where only 70 years ago, the village was a rural community covered in fields. In 1847, Dutch settlers made the long, arduous journey from the Netherlands to America, sometimes taking over two months in brutal weather. Some came for monetary reasons, but most came to find religious freedom, even leaving adequate homes in Holland for the chance to worship freely. The first settlers chose their location solely on agriculture, basing their whole community around it. Using the fertile soil around the Little Calumet River, these settlers were able to harvest a variety of vegetables, but nothing was more prosperous for South Holland than the onion set. Um, my understanding is that the early South Holland farmers were, uh, uh, to a large extent, truck farmers, uh, meaning basically people who uh, uh, grew vegetables to be taken to what today we would call a farmer's market and, and sold to members of the general public. Um, what South Holland became noted for, uh, it was, was called this, the onion set capital of the world. Onion sets being kind of baby onions, which were grown to be sold to home gardeners to plant, to grow the actual onions. At one point before World War II, South Holland produced more onion sets than anywhere in the world. One of the many farming families that first settled in South Holland were the Parlbergs, and still have ties to the area today. Their reason for coming here was the same as other Dutch families, but not without tragedy. They wanted to worship, uh, freedom of worship, and uh, so uh, Anshi Prauberg and her husband Klaus Prauberg, with seven children in 1847, got on a boat and started for America. And uh, about 10 days out, uh, Kl Klaus Prauberg died and was buried at sea. So she came over all by herself with seven children. And uh, from that time on, she was known as the Widow Parlberg. With the stern belief, the Lord will provide, the Widow Parlberg wanted to carry out her husband's wishes and begin a new life. Ancha's son Peter built a house in 1870 that still stands today off Paxton Avenue and 170th Street. In 1970, the Parlberg home was donated to the village of South Holland and has been preserved as a historical landmark by the South Holland Historical Society. Among the things that the Parlbergs did was to, to donate the homestead to us in pretty close to origi original condition, uh, the, uh, the homestead being um, Peter Parlberg's house. Unfortunately, the widow Parlberg's house, uh, uh, which was even older, is lost to us. That was not preserved, but the uh, 1870 house is, and, and, and it's a treasure. Some of the most cherished parts of the homestead are not easily found. My favorite thing at the Parlberg farmstead is the graffiti on the smokehouse. Tunis Parlberg carved his initials on the uh, smokehouse and dated the initials, I believe it's 10504. And now, I mean, that was 1904, which was obvious for 100 years, but now that it's 2004, it's somewhat less obvious that this is uh, old graffiti, not new graffiti. Located in the basement of the village's library, the South Holland Historical Society has been working diligently, maintaining the community's past. We looked for what we could find. Um, to some extent, uh, um, I, I think the things that people give to museums are basically things that they don't want, but feel are perhaps just a little bit too good to put in the trash. But everything has, um, potentially, has, has historic value to it. And uh, unfortunately, we're limited in our space. We can't keep everything, but we certainly are interested in seeing what people might uh, consider donating to us and might consider that we would find of value. Along with the knickknacks and family heirlooms, the South Holland Historical Society also has a large-scale model of downtown South Holland in the 1920s as it existed. A buggy stored in the Parlberg's barn that was used by South Holland's longtime doctor, Dr. Valverde, and the village's third fire truck in 1929 American La France. The, the one thing that I would 
um, personally like to find is one of the photographs supposedly taken in the 19th century of young people climbing and sitting on the top of the steeple, the ball of the steeple of the then building of the first reformed church. Uh, apparently in the early days of the Kodak camera, young men would climb the steeple and get their friends to photograph them to prove that they've done it. We do not have a copy of one of those photographs. I would love to have a copy of that. The First Reformed Church is just one of a number of churches that make up South Holland. The slogan, Faith, Family, and Future, is strongly upheld today. 31 churches exist in the five square miles that make up the village. Even after the 21st Amendment, the village enacted a local prohibition ordinance, making South Holland the only community in the suburbs, and one of the few in the Chicagoland region to have no taverns or liquor stores. For a lot of things they had to go outside of town. Uh, if people wanted to go to a place to uh, have a drink and eat food, they'd just have to go outside of South Holland. So, But some things in South Holland have changed. After World War II, the community saw a boom in population with the construction of the Calumet Expressway in the early 1950s. City dwellers packed up and moved south to the village as land was available. The land became more urban as the new residents chose the village for its peaceful way of life and looked to retreat from the fretfulness of city living. Well, we have, uh, we have uh, histories of um, uh, South Holland that, that discuss the the future of, the, of South Holland as a farming community, and they considered things like war and depression and uh, um, economic calamity and, you know, it's every possible thing that could damage the agricultural crop, but apparently the one thing they did not consider was that the city would expand to the point where the land would become more valuable for houses than for growing uh, crops, and that is what happened. With the growth of new institutions, businesses, and people, some area residents were against the change. But not all residents saw this change as bad. I think one of the reasons that people come to this town is because of uh, uh, faith, family, and uh, future. Uh, that's the reason uh, it's continued to grow. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's sent a, a good uh, principle or a way to have a town.